Welcome to the Reading the Bible Daily with Dave podcast. This podcast is devoted to helping increase your daily exposure to God's Word with a short scripture reading and brief commentary on key ideas, themes, and theology in each chapter. Now please join your host, Dave Jenkins, for today's episode. Well, welcome back to the Reading the Bible Daily with Dave podcast. My name is Dave, and I'm the host for this show. And today is August 21st, and today we're going to look at Leviticus 27. Now, just by way of reminder, every day I read from one chapter of God's Word, so today, Leviticus 27, and then I offer a brief explanation of key ideas, themes, and the theology in that chapter. My goal is to get you into God's Word for about 5 to 20 minutes or so. Well, let's get to our reading now from Leviticus 27. And Leviticus 27 says this, The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the people of Israel and say to them, If anyone makes a special vow to the Lord involving the valuation of persons and the valuation of a male from 20 years old up to 60 years old shall be 50 shekels of silver, according to the shekel of the sanctuary. If the person is a female, the valuation shall be 30 shekels. If the person is from 5 years old, old up to 20 years old the valuation shall be for a male 20 shekels and for a female 10 shekels if the person is from a month old up to five years the valuation shall be for a male five shekels of silver and for a female the valuation shall be three shekels of silver and if the person is 60 years old or over, then the valuation for a male shall be 15 shekels, and for a female, 10 shekels. And if someone is too poor to pay the valuation, then he shall be made to stand before the priest, and the priest shall value him. The priest shall value him according to what the vower can afford. Now, if the vower is an animal that may be offered as an offering to the Lord, all of it that he gives to the Lord is holy. He shall not exchange it or make a substitute for it, good for bad, or bad for good. And if he does, in fact, substitute one animal for another, then both it and the substitute shall be holy. And it is any unclean animal that may not be offered as an offering to the Lord. Then he shall stand uh, the animal before the priest, and the priest shall value it as either good or bad. As the priest values it, so shall it be. But if he wishes to redeem it, he shall add a fifth to the valuation. And when a man dedicates his house as a holy gift to the Lord, the priest shall value it as either good or bad. As the priest values it, so it shall stand. And if the donor wishes to redeem his house, he shall add a fifth to the valuation price, and it shall be his. If a man dedicates to the Lord part of the land that is his possession, then the valuation shall be in proportion to its seed. A homer of barley seed shall be valued by 50 shekels of silver. If he dedicates his field from the year of Jubilee, the valuation shall stand. But if he dedicates his field after the Jubilee, then the priest shall calculate the price according to the years that remain until the year of Jubilee and a deduction shall be made from the valuation. And if he who dedicates the field wishes to redeem it, then he shall add a fifth to its valuation price, and it shall remain his. But if he does not wish to redeem the field, or if he has sold the field to another man, it shall not be redeemed any more. But the field, when it is released in the Jubilee, shall be a holy gift to the Lord, like a field that has been devoted. The priest shall be in possession of it, and if he dedicates to the Lord a field that he has brought, which is not a part of his possession and the priest shall calculate the amount of the valuation for it up to the year of the jubilee and the man shall give the valuation on that day as a holy gift to the lord and so in the year of the jubilee the field shall return to him from whom it was bought to whom the land belongs as a possession Every valuation shall be according to the shekel of the sanctuary. Twenty geras shall make a shekel. But a firstborn of the animal, which as a firstborn belongs to the Lord, no man may dedicate whether ox or sheep, it is the Lord's. And if it is an unclean animal, then he shall buy it back at the valuation and add a fifth to it. Or if it's not redeemed, it shall be sold at the valuation." 
But no devoted thing that a man devotes to the Lord or anything that he has, whether man or beast or of his inherited field, shall be sold or redeemed. Every devoted thing is most holy to the Lord. No one devoted who is to be devoted for destruction for mankind shall be ransomed. He shall surely be put to death. Every tithe of the land, whether of the seed of the land or the fruit of the trees, is the Lord. It is holy to the Lord. If a man wishes to redeem some of his tithe, he shall add a fifth to it. And every tithe of herds and flocks, every tenth animal of all that passes under the herdsman's staff, shall be holy to the Lord. One shall not differentiate between good or bad, neither shall he make a substitute for it. And if he does substitute for it, then both it and the substitute shall be holy, it shall not be redeemed. These are the commandments that the Lord commanded Moses for the people of Israel on Mount Sinai. Well, this is our reading today from Leviticus 27. There is only one problem with making a promise, that is, keeping it. This is especially true in our day, since fulfilling a pledge does not have the same importance now as it once did. We live in a fast-paced world in which being first is more valued in many cases than being right. And since the mindset is to get out in front, it's not surprising that this fosters hasty and regrettable decision-making. Some call this buyer's remorse. At one time, this expression referred to buying a house, but now the phrase refers to almost anything and everything. The popularity of skin tattoos in the last few years has produced a trail of tears by those who regret indulging in the fad. Think before you ink is now the popular cautionary word of advice to potential customers. And the final chapter in the book of Leviticus concerns making vows. A vow is simply a pledge a person makes. A, a, we pledge allegiance to the United States or we say our wedding vows. Sometimes people make commitments to God. These can be formal, such as monastic vows taken in a Roman Catholic church order, or they may be informal promises whispered only in our souls when trouble hits home. Now, the book of Leviticus unexpectedly ends on the subject of fulfilling vows to the Lord. The chapter's instructions regulate the procedures for vows. The chapter seems anticlimactic. The previous chapter offered what might seem a more compelling conclusion to the book. It listed, after all, the blessings, the curses that pertain to Israel's covenant with God based on the behavior of the people. But that is uh, the answer to our surprise. The book closes on the subject of vows because the whole book of Leviticus has concerned the promises that God made to his people. He has commanded through a covenant agreement to dwell among his people if they would live up to the obligations that they had sworn to keep. And since God was faithful in all instances to his vow, the question arises, how are you doing in fulfilling your pledge to God today? The chapter presupposes that the Israelites would make vows. Previously in the book of Leviticus, there were instructions regarding animal sacrifices that fulfilled vow offerings, like in uh, chapter 7 and 22 of this book. Vow offerings were gifts to the Lord at the completion of a vow made to God, often given in thanksgiving to God for deliverance, like in Psalm 56, uh, verse 12. And although there are many details in this chapter that do not correspond to Christian living today, it contains a message that holds true for us today. The message of this chapter is one that we particularly need to hear today because of the ready temptation today to renegotiate, so to speak, our commitment to God. And so Leviticus topics include the dedication of persons and the dedication of possessions to the services of God, to the service, I mean, of God. So first, promises and more promises. We need to understand the st and set the stage for understanding Leviticus 27. The instructions concerning vows assume four important biblical teachings. First, God is generous. First, a whole chapter given to the regulation of vows assumes that vows made to the Lord were sufficiently commonplace to merit such focused attention. Now, why not? Vows were offered out of a heart that was thankful to God for his goodness and for his mercy. God was worshipped because he was the divine caretaker of Israel 
who had redeemed it, provided for it, and protected it. The Israelites individually and collectively owe their existence and liberation from slavery to the kindness of God. He enabled all that they were and all that they had. Their relationship with God defined who they were. Apart from the Lord, the people had no purpose. God established expectations of them since they belonged to God. Second, God is true. God's promises are always reliable because God is always faithful. The certainty of the gospel in the New Testament depends on the truthfulness of God's promises in Christ. 2 Corinthians 1.20 says, For all the promises of God find their yes in Jesus Christ. That is why it is through him that we utter our amen to God for his glory. That God is true is essential to the exhortation in Leviticus 27 that Israel too must be true to her vows. Third, God's people must be true. Now, if God is true, then his people too must be true. The faithfulness of God made it incumbent upon the Israelites to respond in kind, faithfully carrying out their vows to God and to others. The psalmist declared this in Psalm 76, 11. Make your vows to the Lord your God and perform them. Let all around him bring gifts to him who is to be feared. Jesus taught on the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5, 37. Let what you say simply be yes or no. Uh, anything more than this comes from evil. And being honest in our response to God and in our dealings with others is Jesus' expectation of a kingdom citizen. For uh, God's people are sinners. The flip side to this commitment, however, was the reality that the Israelites were no more than sinful human beings. They retained all the human failings that people have despite what God had been to them and what he had done for them. And now when it came to making vows, sometimes they had made them based on momentary enthusiasm without much thought given to the consequences of their actions. Also, they sinned at times by neglecting their vows, refusing to fulfill their intentions. They talked a good game, in other words, but failed to play that game out. The Bible warns against rash decisions in Proverbs 20:25. 20, when it says it is a snare to say rashly it is holy and to reflect only after making vows. What this means is that if a person makes a dedication to the service of God, it must be seriously a seriously considered decision not entered into quickly. Now we can turn to Leviticus 27 and learn what the Israelites could devote to the Lord. This chapter offers two broad categories of vows. Vows that concern dedicated persons in the first eight verses and vows concerning dedicated possessions in verses 9 through 25. So first, a promised life in the first eight verses of Leviticus 27. And the opening paragraph considers the most important commitment that a person can make to the service of God, the dedication of a human life. We make commitments Commitments at important points in our lives that involve our whole person. Marriage and parenting are the most common commitments. We as Christians also make the most deep-seated commitment of all when we entrust ourselves to Jesus Christ for salvation. The Apostle Paul says in Romans 12:1, I appeal to you therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. For Christians, marriage vows and parenting rest on our decision to invest our lives in Jesus with our whole heart. We are more faithful spouses and parents because we are Christian spouses and parents. Our business practices exhibit more integrity than other otherwise because we are Christian businessmen and women. And when we compromise our Christian allegiance, it inevitably shows itself in our human relationships as well. Now, Leviticus recognizes the value of persons dedicated to the service of God. Monetary values were assigned to persons dedicated to the Lord based on their capacity to do manual labor. Now, ask any employer and they're going to tell you that the persons most committed to the success of a company are also the persons most heavily invested in that goal, working tirelessly and honestly. Committed employees are a special asset that may not specifically show up on a balance sheet or inventory, and teachers will tell you the same. A devoted student makes a significant difference in the attitude and learning achievements of the whole class. These persons are, in a word, invaluable. The Israelites could dedicate members of their family, slaves, or themselves to the Lord's service. Hannah, the mother of Samuel, for example, devoted her son to the service of the Holy Tabernacle. But the service of the Lord 
had its natural limitations since not all could help in the precincts of the tent of meeting. Only the priests and the Levites could actually carry out the work of the Lord. In fact, the tabernacle service in most circumstances it required financial resources more than the people. Therefore, it was possible for the Israelites to make a monetary contribution to meet the obligations by paying a sum based on the evaluation of the priest. The exchange of a monetary figure is called redeeming, meaning buying back the person. Now, two factors contributed to the values placed on the persons dedicated, gender and age. The difference in the values corresponded to the reality that people in their prime of their lives make a better contribution, and generally speaking, males are more physically able for labor. The valuations do not reflect the inherent value of any person. All persons are valued by God. The Lord welcomes all who wish to dedicate themselves to his service. The Nazarite vow, for instance, was open to men and women as in number 6-2. If the issue was not a matter of gender alone, it's seen in the fact that a woman of older age was naturally more useful than a male who was a child or elderly. A woman at her peak health merited 30 shekels, whereas an elderly man was valued at only 15 shekels. Now, the, the valuations were significantly costly. Some commentators have suggested that the typical income of a person was one shekel per month. People of modest means rarely could afford to make this kind of contribution to the service of the Lord. But the Lord did not shut them out. It didn't matter if they were not prosperous. What mattered was that the person making the vow had a heart for God. So whatever his financial station, a person devoted to God donated a portion of his income to the Lord. The instructions included a concession for the poor who were held to a standard that took into account their meager wages. This procedure called for the poor person to appear before the priest who made an evaluation according to the person's financial ability. That God would have a special accommodation for the poor is consistent with the benevolent attitude that God takes towards the poor in the word of God. They are especially dear to the heart of God. In fact, Jesus said this in Matthew 5, 3, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now, Leviticus makes special concessions to the poor in very various sacrificial and purity laws. And so what this passage tells us is that is what we know from the New Testament scriptures. When it comes to dedicating our gifts to the Lord, the first thing we must do is to give ourselves. In commending the Christians in Macedonia for sharing out of their means with the ministry of the church in Jerusalem, the apostle Paul said to them in 2 Corinthians 8, 5, they gave themselves first to the Lord and then uh, by the will of God to us. The greatest gift is a committed life to the Lord. Lord. Once we have given ourselves to the kingdom's work, then the release of our possessions more readily follows. The, de the decision to give is already determined by our prior personal commitment to Christ. An example of the interrelationship of commitment to Christ and the yielding of our own possessions is in the case of Christian parents who accept the decision of adult children to surrender to foreign missions. This is a true test of a mother and father's commitment to the gospel. A genuine sacrifice is made. Aging parents may never see their children and grandchildren again. This is a depth of commitment that we as Christian parents teach our children to have. Do we make good on such pledges when God calls us or our loved ones to his service? Another feature of the passage that is familiar to readers of the New Testament is a teaching on voluntary proportional giving. Second Corinthians praises the Macedonian Christians who gave according to their means and beyond their means of their own accord in Second Corinthians 8 3. The Israelites gave according to their ability to serve, both in terms of their physical capability and their financial ability. It was not a matter of whether one person was more devoted because he could give more. The valuations were set according to a person's capacity. Jesus pointed out to his disciples the sacrificial giving of a widow who devoted her meager two coins to the temple's treasury, yet it was all that she had. 
Others gave more money, but less of themselves than she to the Lord, for she gave all, according to Mark 12, 41 through 44. God does not ask of us more than he has enabled us to give. The issue for us, however, is really not our ability to give. It is a matter of our desire to give. If we desire to give ourselves to the Lord, then we will prioritize our expenditures, ensuring that we give of our possessions freely. No, so by giving to the service of the Lord, we are expressing our recognition of Christ's love for us. It is our act of devotion to God. Now let's look at a promised possession for verses 9 through 25 of Leviticus 27. And since the Lord delivered and abundantly blessed them, individuals expressed vows of thanksgiving by dedicating their material assets. This meant giving animals, houses, and tracts of land. The patriarch Jacob made such a vow, swearing to return a tenth part of all that he might acquire if the Lord returned him to his homeland safely, like in Genesis 28. Today, people will sometimes bequeath to charitable organizations cars, houses, furniture, and properties. We call this giving in kind. These items are liquidated and the monies are used for operating the charity or the church. Now, regulations in Leviticus 27, they set the practice in the framework of Israel's covenant commitment to God. Animals pledged to the Lord might be of two kinds, clean or unclean. Leviticus 11 detailed what was a clean animal. These species were fitting for an offering since they could be presented at the altar of the Lord. Unclean animals were animals that did not qualify for an offering presented on the altar. Clean animals were deemed holy in our text because they were consecrated to the worship of God. And once a person had vowed a clean animal, he was prohibited from substituting an animal of lesser value. If he tried to do so, both the original and the substitute animals would be deemed holy. Therefore, both would be belong to the sanctuary. The animals could not be redeemed. And in the case of an unclean animal, the priests evaluated it and set a redemption price. The Israelites could redeem it by paying the valuation plus a 20% surcharge. What we see from this example is that making vows to the Lord was a costly business and required the careful decision of the worshiper. Israelites viewed their pledges far more seriously than people seem to think of them today. The Bible encourages and even expects Christians to give of their resources, but the Bible also expects us to be thoughtful and loyal in our giving. We only trivialize God when we make empty promises or half-baked ones. Now, a person might choose to dedicate his house or land to the service of God, making such donations a holy gift. The word dedicates is the translation of a word meaning to consecrate, that is to contribute something or someone to the sacred work of God. And in the case of a house, the same rules applied to it as for unclean animals. The priest appraised the worth of the house and the owner could redeem it by adding 20% of the assessment. The dedication of land was a more complicated matter and it required further explanation. Now, without going into too many details here, we can summarize by observing that the rules of depositing land were influenced by three factors. First, the rules were adjusted based on the custody of the property, whether the land belonged to the donor presently or if it had been sold or purchased, like in verse 22 of our text. In other words, the custody of the land. Second, the custom of the Jubilee took precedence in evaluating the worth of the land. In the year of Jubilee, land reverted to the original family ownership. This meant that the priest's evaluation included calculating the number of harvests that remained until the year of Jubilee. And third, the monetary measure of the assessed value was consistently the same, specifically here called the shekel of the sanctuary as in verse 25. The dedication of such costly items showed the enthusiasm that a person had for the worship and ministry of the sanctuary. And so making and faithfully keeping one's vows was a sign of a person's spiritual condition. Vows were considered holy gifts to the Lord that were to be given out of a holy motivation and for a holy purpose. The psalmist declared in Psalm 61 verse 8, So will I ever sing praise to your name as I perform my vows day after day. A vow offering that celebrated the fulfillment of a vow usually was an animal sacrifice and bread offerings like in Leviticus 7. The vow offering was one of three kinds of peace offerings in addition to thanksgiving offerings and free will offerings. 
uh, uh, gifts. Portions of the animal not burned up on the altar were eaten by the priest and the worshiper. And so a fellowship meal concluded the peace offering and family, friends, and the poor were invited. This symbolized fellowship with God and with the community for the peace offering was a food gift to the Lord, like in Leviticus 3 and Leviticus 3.16. Now let's look at a promise with integrity from Leviticus 27, 26 to 34. Because of the human temptation to renege on promises or manipulate the system, the regulation closed potential loopholes and encouraged godly behavior. The importance of integrity in our promises is strikingly illustrated by the frightening deaths of a husband and wife in the early days of the church. Acts 5, 1 through 11, it recounts the lies of Ananias and Sapphira who gave to the church proceeds from the sale of the land all to their credit but lied to the holy spirit by falsely claiming that they gave all of the proceeds although they had kept back some for themselves their crime was not that they held back some but that they made false promises our leviticus passages addresses three ways that a person may have attempted to dodge his responsibility now, the law already required that all firstborn children and animals belong to the Lord in Exodus 13.2. These firstborn could not be dedicated to the Lord a second time as a fulfillment of a special pledge. This would be akin to offering up a tithe to the Lord as both your regular gift to the church and also as a special offering to the service of the church. The firstborn of unclean animals were redeemable, however, since they could not be offered to the Lord on the altar. Now, the same principle it applied to the land, the animals, and persons devoted to God. Devoted items were totally restricted to the Lord's service as shown by their identity in the text as most holy gifts. Devoted items or persons could not be redeemed. In fact, the word devoted in our text is the same word for putting something or someone under ban. This was true of cities, persons, and things committed to total destruction because they were an offense to the Lord. Such were the cities that made war against Israel in Joshua 6:17 and uh, Joshua 7, 12 through 13. Persons devoted to the Lord were probably slaves who were committed to service in the sanctuary by their owners. Those who were put to death were the persons who had been assigned to destruction, such as criminals and prisoners of war. We must assume that this fatal decision was in the hands of an appropriate tribunal as the Mosaic law called for in Numbers 35. And since these persons were already given over to the Lord, they could not be redeemed. This was true of murderers whose lives could not be spared by paying a monetary penalty. Now, the third loophole was the use of a tithe. The people were commanded to offer up a tithe of all the land's produce and all of their herds as the portion belonging to the service of the Lord's sanctuary. And since tithes were already set aside as holy, they could not be offered again in the case of a vow. An exception permitted here is the tithe of agricultural products that could be translated into money. In this case, the Israelites must add a fifth to the valuation as in the ordinary vows. Animals, however, destined for the sanctuary could not be redeemed. Now, in many ways, the New Testament teaching on giving to the Lord parallels what we have discovered for the conduct of vows and peace offerings. Hebrews 13, 16 says, Do not neglect to do good and to, and to share what you have, for such sacrifices are pleasing to God. The giving practices of the church, they include giving liberally, faithfully, and proportionally. It was a yardstick measuring the spiritual condition of a Christian and a church. Giving to the service of the Lord reflects the sacrificial giving of Christ, who set aside his personal prerogatives to provide the riches of his glory for us who were impoverished by our sin. So for a Christian, material wealth and their acquisitions are subject to spiritual goals. We don't have a choice. Each master demands a complete commitment, either to wealth or to the kingdom of God. Jesus said this in Matthew 6, 24. You cannot serve God and money. We want both because we are children of the consumer age and our prosperity in the West has lifted us up to unparalleled affluence, but also unparalleled avarice. It is striking that we as Christians, we who have sworn allegiance to the cause of Christ by dedicating our souls, our families, future, and our hopes and ambitions to the gospel. But you see, sometimes we stumble at devoting our material goods or ourselves to the work of the Savior. This is a telltale sign that demands that we look at ourselves. In our culture of affluence, there is a reticence in some circles to reveal what we earn financially because it has a direct bearing on our status 
in society. And yet at the same time, the persons who hide their financial worth do not flinch at telling about the intimate matters of their lives. This incongruity shows how holy money has become for us in the West. As Christians, we can give a strong witness to our heavenly priorities when we manage our money in a godly manner. Now, one of the greatest hindrances to our giving in the church today is the confusion that some Christians have regarding to whom we give our resources. Is it to the Lord, to the church as an institution, to the pastor? The gifts we bring to the work of the church for the spreading of the gospel are devoted to our Savior, Lord. Lord and King, not to the church leadership. Our offerings are in the safekeeping of leaders and biblically qualified men for sure. But ones who are under God must act with integrity by realizing that they handle holy things. Again, if we are willing to subject our souls to preaching and the example of a biblically qualified male pastor and church leaders, and yet we cannot support their financial leadership in the church, we must reconsider the priorities we have in our handling over money for the Lord's work. If we cannot support the work of the Lord in our church in good conscience, we should consider placing our lives in a church where we can enthusiastically support the mission of the church. We must not be guilty of neglect or withholding the church hostage because of our personal dissatisfaction. Now, the chief lesson to take from this chapter in Leviticus is a costly discipleship that worship and ministry require. We stand on the shoulders of those who have preceded us making sacrificial gifts for the Christian gospel. These sacrifices are not only the giving of money, but also the offering of themselves in time, energy, and career. It was the Asia Minor, the modern-day Turkey Church of Philippi, that supported the missionary travels of the Apostle Paul in Macedonia, where the gospel came to Europe for the first time in, according to Acts 16, 9-10. The evangelization of Europe initiated by the Apostle resulted in the shift of the epicenter of the gospel from the Middle East to Europe. Europe was in turn the seedbed for the rise of the church in colonial America and the modern missions movement. We are the beneficiaries of the saints who came before us. The forefathers of our churches gave themselves and their resources to make the gospel known to us and to our loved ones. Perhaps a word in, is in order regarding the practical aspects of making some pledges and the outworking of developing budgets for ministry. Some may find such things even too secular to even talk about, even perhaps unspiritual. But the word of God shows that planning and strategy, strategizing are to be taken account when the spirit works through human instruments. The Apostle Paul advised the Corinthian church to establish a plan for the gathering of money for their gift to the poor in 1 Corinthians 16. Wherever the Spirit is not bound by our human plans and he moves to change our direction to coincide with his mission, like in Acts 16 6 and Romans 15. Careful planning is a characteristic of good stewardship and does not necessarily oppose the work of the Spirit. We are not to be wishy-washy in our pledges, lest we be charged with irresponsibility. For integrity in our decision making should describe our Christian character. The book of Proverbs often refers to planning as a necessary part of human existence and even commands it in Proverbs 21 5. The plans of the diligent lead surely to abundance, but everyone who is hasty comes only to poverty. Now, the word of God only forewarns against being presumptuous in our planning, as though we know God's will with certainty in 1 Corinthians 4.19 and James 4.15. Rather, in matters of dispute and uncertainty, we should humbly pray, let the will of the Lord be done, like in Acts 21.14. The scriptures teach us that Christian duty is part of the outflow of receiving the gospel. You see, when we come to know Christ as our Savior and King, we make a decision to give all the that we are and all that we have to him for his service. The chief idea here is surrender, meaning that we obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus as Paul wrote in 2 Thessalonians 1.8. The obedience of faith, as Romans 1, 5 calls us to, it calls us to serve the Lord without reservation and with a full-hearted integrity in worship to God and in service to others. We can capture the message of this chapter, and for that matter, the whole book of Leviticus in this one sentence. The robust gospel calls for a robust response of a robust person. Well, I want to thank you for listening or watching today's episode of Reading the Bible Daily with Dave. My name is Dave, and today is August 21st, and we've looked at Leviticus 27. Until tomorrow, may the Lord richly bless you and keep you. 
Thank you for listening to today's episode of Reading the Bible Daily with Dave podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe to the show and rate us wherever you listen to podcasts. Be sure to also like, subscribe, or follow Servants of Grace on Facebook, Instagram, X, or YouTube. We appreciate your support.